Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. We are Outdoor Cameraman Experience. I am Jess Dilo with my co-host, Jake Latondras, and we are Latondras Media Collective. How are you doing, Jake? I'm doing well, Jess. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm good. Are you all dried out from your big Bassmasters uh, filming extravaganza? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, I was, I just got back late last night. I was up in, uh, in uh, New York, up on the St. Lawrence River near Syracuse, about two and a half hours from Syracuse. And uh, yeah, we had a, a smallmouth tournament for Bassmaster Elite. It was the last, the last event of the season. And it turned out to be one of the greatest, the one of the greatest bass tournaments ever held. It was extraordinary. That's awesome. And I saw a couple of the shots you were putting up. You were in like the action boat. I was in a boat. Yeah, I was in a boat with Justin <laughs> Lewis, a young, uh, very, very talented and very competitive angler. Uh, he's one of the top anglers in the Bassmaster Elite Series. And he was he went into championship Sunday in third place. And then uh, he was doing really well midday. And he caught a very large sack of smallmouth bass like these fish were so big, they didn't even look real. So, <laughs> yeah, and he, and he ended up uh, coming in second. And uh, ironically, his best friend, who he teammates up with a lot of times, ended up winning the tournament. So it was exciting, and there was a big crowd there. It was, it was really cool. Nice. I was out on the water briefly. I had to learn how to paddleboard because I had a job where I'd photograph one this weekend. So that was an interesting experience. However, I think I did pretty well, and we caught on pretty quick. It wasn't that difficult. But I was, I was thinking certainly I was going to be like dumped in at some point. But it was all you good. never fell in. No. You know, <laughs> no. Okay, good. Because Amy was on the front. She was on her knees. She had a little pink life jacket on. I'm thinking, okay, if that thing slips out from under her, she's going to whoop. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of nervous about her because she would, whenever she would move, like the the center of gravity would kind of tilt a little bit on there. So I kind of threatened her a little bit. I'm like, Ooh. you cannot move. Like, <laughs> uh, it would have stunk too because we had a whole bunch of like fishing gear on the board and stuff. I was just picturing like everything like falling. But the thing was really, really sturdy and I was impressed. I don't know that I will be uh, actively fly fishing from a paddle board often around here, but it's definitely an option now. It's pretty neat. I've actually been, you know, those things are trend or are, are super trendy right now and very popular. Those in, in the sit down fishing kayaks. Mm -hmm. and I've been thinking about investing in one. Maybe, uh, maybe this winter I'll find one on sale and have one <laughs> ready for next summer. I'm, I would, it would be, it would fit in really well here in Colorado. Yeah, you got plenty of space up there. They just drained our local like lake and the streams are kind of small for a paddleboard. So I don't know about right here. Anyway, today we have a pretty good show. We have a really awesome guest and friend, uh, Matt McCormick, professional commercial photographer, uh, handles, what is his title? He's a community ambassador management uh, for Sika, and he also used to work at Seacat Creative. And I don't know if you guys are familiar, but they're pumping out some of the best uh, media on social networking and handling all sorts of big brands. And Matt is super experienced and accomplished uh, professional photographer in the outdoors industry. So we're excited to have him with us today. So, Not to mention, um, he's one of the really, really good guys in the industry, and he's always very pleasant to be around. And every time, uh, every time I see him, it's he's got this infectious smile, and you just want to go up and give him a big <laughs> hug. There it is. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's bring Matt McCormick on. How you doing, Matt? Hey guys, how are you? Good. Matt. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, wow, that was quite the uh, introduction. Thanks for that. Yeah. You can always give me a hug, Jake, anytime. Like, oh, I will. Next time I see you, I'll give you a great big hug. I, I look forward to that. I'm going to look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in October when you come out. Definitely, for sure. Yeah, I'm looking you're forward up to in, that. You're up in Bozeman, right? Yeah, up in Bozeman. Um, been living here for uh, almost five years now. Gosh, I can't believe how the time flies. Yeah, I've been here for almost five years, and uh, – you know, as Jess, as you mentioned, working with CCAT Creative, that's what got me here. Mark got me here. He, you know, basically gave me an opportunity that's just like, listen, man, if you want to come up here, you just show up and we got a spot for you. And uh, I kind of packed everything up and, and jumped yes. at that opportunity. And, and now I've been here for about five years. You came, from, I got to adjust my light. Sorry about this, people. You, uh, you came from Wisconsin. Is that right? Uh, Wisconsin originally. Yeah. I lived in Idaho for a few years as well. Um, hunting and, and working down there. Um, 
but for the most part, yeah, I mean, grew up in Wisconsin, uh, hunting basically urban geese in the, in the green Bay area, uh, with a couple of really good pals of mine. And then, uh, but from there moved out to Idaho basically for the hunting and, and some opportunity there and, and lived there for about four years. The hunting was awful. <laughs> and, uh, and then I moved up here and the hunting is not nearly as good as it is down there, <laughs> but it's still fun up here. It's uh, uh, we got a great group of guys up here and, uh, and we're getting it figured out, you know, five years on the road, uh, a lot of windshield time kind of puts it into perspective when you're, when you're out goose hunting and this place has got some, some geese to offer. Um, but again, Pacific flyaway, intermountain type geese, kind of like, not like the front range down by you guys. <laughs> you're going to have to come down and hunt with us on the Platte river. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some experience on the Platte river. Um, for the last few years I've gone and, uh, photographed with field and clay hud and all down there and, and a good pal of mine, uh, the holes fasters and stuff. And, yeah, that place is, it's unbelievable. That's on the other Actually, end of the state, it. so you'll have to come out to the western part of the state now. That would, yeah, 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 that would be awesome. It would be so fun, because we go down there with Doug, and Doug was on here, and yeah, we have a, we have a ton of fun down there every year, but I want to come check out what you guys got going on. So when you, uh, you know, when you moved out here, you said Seacat had given you an opportunity. How did that come about? How did they find you? Where, where did all that start, man? That's got to be That's an actually, interesting story in, a, actually, in a, coveted, a coveted position at that. Yeah, it actually is pretty interesting, you know, and, and not to take the, you know, take the story out of, out of their mouths because the, the Seacat creative story is actually really cool. Um, but in 2013, they were, you know, only about a year and a half old at that time. Uh, I had been living in Idaho, kind of looking for a little bit of a change in, in career and saw the film Searching for West. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, that's a film about Mark um, that Helio Collective and him collaboratively made um, with Sick of Gear and Yeti. Um, this was in 2000. I think that was filmed in 2011, 2012, released in 2013. And I saw that film and was just like, there's something really special going on here with uh, – with creativity in the hunting industry and and this is really cool i've never seen anything like this before right like you guys have seen it it's it's still to this day one one of the best and foundationally one of the best uh one of the most you know creative pieces and innovative pieces that we've had in our space and um he had a he had a quote in that film where he said people are expecting me to be hunting and i'd never really understood what that meant and it was really interesting because I looked up Seacat Creative, I looked up Mark, I looked up all this stuff, tried to figure out, you know, what is what does this guy do? Why are people expecting him to be hunting? And so I went on their Facebook page and I just sent him a, a Facebook message and just was like, hey, I, I watched this film. Awesome. I want to know more about what this is or what's going on. Uh, if you guys, if you guys, you know, get this and you want to get back to me, here's my number. And... Mark actually got back to me personally, called my cell phone, and we talked for about, you know, 45 minutes or so. And was, was this solely based on what you had sent to him or did he was there a platform that you had, you know, had built up so he could he could, you know, this was in 2013. And, right. So this was bef this is like pre Instagram. If you can remember those days, there's such a time. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Pretty and I'd been taking photos, but <clears throat> but not nothing like just wildlife photos and photos of my pals, you know. And so he would, or he actually called, you know, based on that based on that Facebook message. We got to talk, and um, again, talked for about 45 minutes, and and then it kind of just went astray. I gave him an idea that I had that I still have that nobody's done that I think is really cool that maybe one day I'll share with everybody. And, <laughs> oh, you don't want to um, tell us? <laughs> not yet. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, like a month later they had posted up a, a photo of, of a guy glassing and said, we're looking for interns and on their Facebook page. And so I applied did a Skype interview, something very similar to what we have going on right here. Um, sent in a, you know, a bunch of photos and stuff. And I had a Skype interview with uh, Steve Drake and Adam Foss, which were, you know, two of, I, 
they had a few more employees at that time, but basically, you know, two of the first three employees. And Mark just rolled into the screen, like from here. And he looks at the camera and he's like, Matt, if you want this, all you got to do is show up. We got a desk for you. And so I just, I had a trip to Ontario that I was doing. I came back, I loaded up all my stuff into my truck. I moved into the basement of a guy's house and, and I've been here ever since. That's awesome. Yeah. What a great opportunity, but really, I mean, you know, this is a common denominator in some of the success stories that we've talked about on our show many times. And that is that, you know, you have to have the guts to reach out to someone, particularly someone that you want to be a part of and you want to, you know, you want to be become part of a family, a solid family. And when you reach out to them, you know, if you have the if you if you say the right things and, and approach it the right way, you know, with professionalism and all those things that you raise eyebrows and then, you know, how does it go? They look back into your background, maybe, or interview you and one or two things. I mean, first impressions are so important. And obviously your first impression reflects exactly who you are. And, Mm -hmm. and even if we were to go back into time to that day, I wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't surprise me that they hired you based on who you are and and how you approach things. Well, I appreciate that, Jake. And yeah, you know, he, he kind of, you know, he just kind of gave me an opportunity and, and it was up to me to capitalize on it. And that's kind of how that works, right? You're going to get a little bit of the bone and you got to take the whole thing. And, and it was a really cool time in my life going into there with so many, so many uh, creative and talented people in there at that time. And that was when my photography game like really elevated because we used to have these sessions where we would go out and we'd photograph and we'd come back and the digital asset guy would like Jordan Gill, he'd put all the photos together in Lightroom and then he'd create like a 10 photo slideshow and we would all sit around it and then it would basically be like roast the photographer (laughs) on what you did wrong and what you did right and how you're going to get better. Mm -hmm. And and it was really just that, I mean, yeah, it was an extremely productive exercise and we just did that all the time. And, and the truth is, is freelancing, we don't get that. So today I don't have that. And I miss that a lot about, uh, about working there with that type of family and that type of confidence and everybody's just hungry to make a change. And, and, uh, and the truth is, is we were on the leading edge of it. You know, Sika was just starting to, you know, build that type of content. And it was just a, it was really fun, just a bunch of, kids playing business and having fun just like <laughs> changing the industry to what it is in today and and i and i honestly believe that sika you know and the ck creative team at that time is was kind of the foundation of that it was really cool to be a part of it and that a small part but it's a, a part of it I, th- I think i think too that that you know that has really uh vaulted you know, everyone involved. I mean, think about all the names you've already addressed, you know, Jordan Gill, Stephen Drake, all these people, the CCAT mm-hmm. brand, the Sitka brand. And these are leaders. I mean, everyone that you mentioned is a leader of some sort in what they're doing now. And, you know, that just goes to show that, you know, when people take, when people take charge of, of what they're doing and, and become leaders in the industry that, you know, you continue to, to set trends and, and, you know, it, it, it sets the pace for everyone else. Everyone else is chasing it, right? Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that, a, is that fair for me to say? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, at, in the beginning, it was a huge risk, right? It was, a, it was completely different. So it was deviating from the system and, and that nobody was chasing us. We were the only ones out there doing it. And it's now today, you know, everybody's doing it, which is the best thing ever that the, could happen to the hunting space. Um, in my oh, opinion, man. just people respecting hunting and the animals and the experience, but also just like, just being proud of being a hunter and, mm-hmm. and talking about everything all encompassing hunting. And that's just not something that anybody talked about before. It was always just about the animal and trophy and, if it's not a trophy, it's not getting talked about type of thing. You know what I mean? So what, um, once you got involved with CCAT, what were some of your kind of like greenhorn tasks there? What did, what were some of your daily beginner internship duties? <laughs> yeah. My unpaid internship duties, uh, consisted of, uh, <laughs> initiation. Consisted, into yeah. The fraternity. I, uh, built everybody new desks. Um, 
nice. that was pretty fun and they're still using them today we um as far as the workload goes um i was helping when i first started out they do a lot of social management right and, th and back then it was like instagram was just starting so it's building social accounts building brands on social doing that like that was the that was the big kind of cash cow and so i was running wild sheep foundation and arctic red river outfitters uh instagram and facebook pages um for the first like four months and we slowly four or five months and then we slowly started transitioning into more stuff with sick gear and as their as they began to ramp up and need more help um, and the CCAT creative team, you know, kind of expanded, I moved into a Sitka role um, where I was helping manage their account, um, Instagram, Facebook. This was back to that. This would have been 2014. Instagram, Facebook, kind of that where we finally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the first question that came up. So I don't. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I'll, I'll build a desk for you. I built one the other day. It's actually really nice. Um, the, I can't remember where I was, but we're now selling discs by Matt. We're selling desks. <laughs> Sick of Instagram and Facebook. That's where we were. And we yep. started just doing, you know, we had this collective team. So we were taking photos for Sika and we were managing their account and we were helping build their brand. Their marketing team was one person. David Brinker at that time, you know, now it's seven or eight plus three agencies. That place and, has exploded. Yep. Um, really cool to see um, <laughs> a lot of big growth. Um, but back then it was just one guy, David, doing his thing um, and kind of trusting us to help build the community brand via social and, and doing really fun giveaways and fun, interactive community stuff. And uh, that's, what, that's what we did. Uh, we managed social accounts and we took photos and we used the photos for social and we told stories about people we knew. And so what did, what do you think that did? I mean, how did that, how did that elevate the brands? Like what, what, how did that get into the minds of and, and change the culture? Because that's really, you know, we talked about this with Doug Steinke and Lee Chose. It ch it's changed the culture because there's more creativity. There's more art. There's more profoundness in the content that's that's out there now. And it goes back to, you know, those days when that started. And we talk about how that really got pulled in from maybe the fly fishing world, the snowboarding world, mm -hmm. the skateboarding world and the snow skiing world, say going all the way back to Warren Miller. What did that do? What did you guys see? How did, when you started seeing the traction, then what happened? Um, I, I will say that it was adopted from the mountaineering snow ski, you know, like Arcteryx world, right? That was definitely adopted from that world. At least that's where our vision was. Um, mostly because Mark was a mountaineer, mountaineering expert at that time, you know, and that's kind of the, that was a little bit of his passion, but a lot of his inspiration. And so having that vision for that really made it like, there's these harsh elements, there's all of this stuff and there's all of these people doing these things that are really difficult and inspiring and, and awesome. He saw it with him that he is this guy, this nucleus of CCAT creative and we, and we were all there because of him. That type of feeling and environment um, is what we kind of fed off of. And then we knew that there was other stories out there just like that. And so it was about the people and the fly fishing world, for sure. The creativity in that is, is awesome. And it, and it has been for a long time, guys like Brian Gregson and Brian Grossenbacher and those guys have been doing it for so long. Um, but nobody ha was able to figure out a way to put a, a, a artful touch, a beautiful kind of gritty feel to hunting and still be able to like show it to a non hunter. Right. That was the, that was the hardest part. Like, how do you do this? How do you tell exactly. the story mm -hmm. and, and not, not offend people all the time. And so that was kind of the vision. I can't remember the original question. I should have wrote it down, but that was kind uh, of like where we were headed. And yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. 
Because yeah, it, it, told, was, like you said, it, it tells more of a story than just the kill. And we have to represent, I mean, you know, thinking creatively and really more importantly, respectfully towards the entire culture, what we do, all the bashing that we get. We had to suppress that with respect. I mean, mm-hmm. it, that's the bottom line. And I think that's what that 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 development of creativity did. It brought respect to the the visual aspect of our culture. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and it's funny because when you guys were asking me to put together some imagery that I like and would like to talk about for the podcast and stuff, some of my favorite shots, and I was having a tough time picking single images from trips and picking picking just single images because it's like there's so much more to all of this, mm-hmm. right? And And the goal of going on a trip is to tell the whole story. You know, sometimes the goal on an assignment will be to get this product shot and these details and whatever like that's part of it right that that's part of it but if you're trying to tell a story you can't do it in one image you can do you can tell a a portion of the story in one image you can tell a a moment and you could feel it and and everything if you do it right but you can't tell the whole story and so i actually contemplated just giving you 10 photos from the same trip and like going through that journey um with you guys for that um i chose not to (laughs) That would be a good angle, though, because that I think that's what, you know, a lot of, as you know, there are so many people doing this. And I don't mean to dominate this conversation, Jess, just so no, cut me fine. off. Any it's time. fine. <laughs> but, you know, when, I mean, we all know that there's a lot of people that are, that are coming into <clears throat> the photography video world. Everybody's jockeying for position. Everybody wants to be a part of this brand and that brand. And. Um, you know, the one thing that's lacking, in my opinion, there's a lot of great photographers out there. A, the technology is so user friendly now, it makes things a lot easier than it used to be. But also, you know, there's so many people trying to do the same thing now. And I think one of the things that's lacking for all you young photographers out there that want to know how to build yourself and how to get into this, tell the story because there's a, there's a beginning, there's a middle and there's an end. And if you leave one of those three components out, you're not telling the whole story. And that's, what's really compelling about, about each, each, each event. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, Jess does a great job of it. You do a great job of it. You know, that's, that's the really important part. Um, in this whole thing is being able to tell the story The the single picture is, is great and captivating and catches people's attention. Like, that's awesome. And there's a story behind that one. Just drop my pen. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think maybe, maybe we should do that sometime. One of these days we'll do something like that on here where that we could go cool. through, a, we go through King Eiders and St. Paul Island or something and kind of tell the journey of that story or whatever. Have, and just um, kind of, we should do a, a reminiscent of your sea cat days too. We should get a bunch of people on here. We should all just roast each other's photography. <laughs> just do. I we think should. it's a great idea. Man. That'd be a lot of just fun. Just put one photo up and then uh, and then let everybody give their their can, candid feedback. Yeah. And I think you know I think one of the things is that could, that could do for the viewers as well is open up people's minds and hearts mm-hmm. and spirit to being criticized productively so that you mm-hmm. do get better because you know we all we all hide behind our ego sometimes and I think it's important to come out of that shell and liberate yourself from that so that you do get better and you can take criticism because at the end of the day we're all trying to I mean at least most of his friends are trying to help each other right For sure in that in that world, we were jockeying a little bit for position, but we were also wanting to help, and we were all a part of this. We we're all a part of this movement, and we mm-hmm. and we are all a team. So your win is my win, and that's still the way it is today. And and with all of us there, but all of us hunting photographers that are telling stories and changing this industry, we're all in this together. Yes, we're battling for positions with brands and stuff like that. Like that's part of business. But one thing to remember is we are all working together to like create this movement and tell these stories about these crazy, awesome, inspiring people that are out there. Um, Just like the people in your lives growing up or whenever that have helped you get to where you're at today. Like that's really important to not lose sight of. Going back to um, what you mentioned that uh, the new Diverge for this year is coming out soon that Sitka presents. Um, And it was really interesting last year um, to see kind of like the live broadcast of uh, the panel kind of 
doing what we just said, like not necessarily roasting, but criticizing everybody's work. And I remember um, just co having conversations with people about it. And there were some who thought like, wow, they're, they're being so critical. And, and I can't believe they said this about that photo and that about this photo. But at the same time, it's like, everybody on that panel has had similar experiences to back up all of their opinions and everything is moving higher and the bar is getting pushed higher. So I really, really enjoyed watching um, just the way everybody kind of like, well, basically like critiqued everything. And I think that that's important. And like you said, freelance photographers like ourselves, we don't always get that opportunity. So it's really good to be able to have a small network or to bounce things off of one another or to participate in something like the Diverge contest. And mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited for it this year. And I'm happy to hear that you might be involved. So that will be really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. It's uh they did ask me to be on the panel and I'm deaf and I, and I said yes right away. Uh, I had to shuffle some things around a little bit, but I, I think it's going to be a really neat thing continuing to go forward. It's a, it's a fun, uh, unique photo contest that, you know, has a lot of incentive and you get to have that feedback, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, and people who aren't, I wish we could feedback connected. more. Yeah. Like a, it's just a direct line to, to all the professionals in this industry there's there are people who have won this contest or placed in the contest who no one has heard of ever before they posted mm -hmm. something so it's a really really neat way to get yourself involved and just be able to have a little bit of a connection with some people that you may look up to or that you're interested mm -hmm. in and how they became professionals and yeah, yeah. i'd like to i'd thing. like to back up just a, just a hair and talk about this this team concept that you know basically is what you're describing because you know again that's something that's really really important for people to understand if you look at if you look at the brands the producers and the manufacturers and 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 media groups all these things <laughs> all the people that are successful that are ultra successful yeti sitka ccat rock house motion all these all these things have one element that's a, a really important common denominator and that is a teamwork and they have people that care about the ultimate goal sure we all have egos and we, we we want our work to stand out but at the end of the day and what's most important is elevating the team and the whole concept as as one and when that happens everyone prospers from that and i think that's really important and and all the things that you're describing everyone included in there is a is a great team first mm-hmm uh somebody commented earlier is define success dot 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 um I mean, that could go so many different ways depending on how how we approach it. Uh, success professionally, I mean, at least for me, would be to uh, get published, be paid for my work, support my family. And uh, I mean, being able to do what I love and, and support my lifestyle for me is success. But that could totally uh, change for the next person as well. What's success for you, Jake? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Success for me is feeling that sense of accomplishment, whether, you know, I get paid for it or not. If if I don't know that, you know, rewards or accolades can really define success. It's really how I feel after mm -hmm. I snap a shot and all everything else is extracurricular after that. You know, whether it's, you know, monetary value or people patting you on the back saying that was a great shot. Or that was a great film, whatever it is. I feel like, and, and the other thing is probably the most important thing is if you can snap photos or, or, or produce a film that can help someone else elevate mm -hmm. their game. I feel like that's a very, that's a very defining uh, position to be in as far as, as yeah. success goes. To be able to evolve the industry with what you're putting out. What about you, Matt? Any, any, was there a moment for you where you felt like, okay, I've succeeded or is it a constant journey still? It's a constant journey. And, and it's, it's funny that Tony asked this question because he's one person that you guys could potentially have on this and, and he would blow people's minds and we're his going to for are, sure. We've yeah, talked to him about it already. Yeah. yeah his, his accomplishments are unbelievable in the wildlife world and also the commercial world. Um, success for me, it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, in my opinion, you know, we're always going to continue to grow and evolve. And if we stop, then, then we're doing something wrong. But the, uh, the important thing for me is going on a shoot and being able to tell that story 
the best way I can. And, and when I come out of it, did I do a good job or the, were the people stoked that I was there? Did I give justice to those people that were there? You know, they're letting me into their lives to tell their story. Um, were they happy with it? And if they're happy, I'm happy. I think mm -hmm. I'm very critical of the work itself, but without, without the people in front of the camera, this can't happen. Now, you know, the commercial stuff can happen and the paid talent thing can happen, but, but real life, authentic uh, imagery and mm -hmm. storytelling doesn't happen without these people. And, and they've lived their whole lives to get to where they are today. And I get the chance to tell their story. Their story is, it's worth a lot. And if I can do that in a meaningful way and uh, they're happy with it, I'm, I'm pretty happy. That's pretty successful. Awesome. There's so much out there as well, as far as content and photographs are across all industries. It's so easy. I mean, anybody can take a photo now, but to successfully be able to transcend a story through, through an image or a collection of images, <clears throat> I mean, that essentially is probably the most successful thing I think you could be able to do. Um, I mean, you're, you're an artist, but to be able to put your personal spin on showcasing what the, someone else's reality is, is a really special thing. Mm-hmm. I remember posting some photos into a forum on refuge forums or something like that back, back um, in 2012 or 2011, sometime around there, posting some photos into there from a snowshoeing adventure that I'd had. And so they were landscape photos, right? And I was pretty pumped on them with my, you know, the equipment that I had. And I would just put them into this photography forum. And this guy just like ripped into me and basically told me like not to post any more photos like that into this forum that I'm wasting <laughs> people's time. And that was a huge driver for me to like, okay, there's obviously more here than just taking a picture. So I need to figure out what that is. And, um, and that was really the driver to like, <clears throat> I got to figure out what this is. I didn't go to school for this. I need to teach myself. And I started learning and then had a team around soon had a team around me. And yeah, yeah. I None saw, of us went to school either for this. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I saw us uh I saw a little piece on Crystal Wright, who's a you know a, a very famous photographer in the uh, adventure outdoor space. And mm -hmm. something that she said really resonated with me one time. She said she said, I was a landscape photographer and all my photos, I always thought they were great, but they were just they were just landscapes and and then i learned someone said something about one of my photos and said man can't you take <clears throat> pictures of something else or something critical like that and, you know she had to face that reality as well and when she did she started she didn't stop taking landscape photos she just added the human element particularly the human adventure element to the landscape so now she describes herself as a landscape photographer with with a, a sprinkle of human element. And because of that, her photos are epic and she's all over the place now. So, you know, that, that's something else for a lot of people out there to think about. Yeah. Let's um, dive into a couple of the stories and the photos that you sent. Let's talk about like mm -hmm. in a particular image, maybe destination or just whatever. Let's put, let's talk about something. Um, mm -hmm. Some of these photos. A little image roulette. Here we go. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to pick. <clears throat> this one for now. I really like this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, depending on how you guys, yeah. I mean, this photo for me, I, I took this photo this year in January um, down in Oklahoma. Um, that's my good friend and owner of 737, uh, Dustin Jones and his SOK dog, Zeus. Um, portrait photography is something that I've never really been into and something that I'm trying to learn more about. And so every time I get the opportunity to try to capture an authentic portrait, um, I, I, try to take, I try to take advantage of it. Um, I get so many asks for headshots and portraits, and I rarely take good ones. So this one is, is one of my favorites that I've taken up until now. It actually is my favorite one up until now. It kind of you know shows Dustin for who he is. Um, with his dog and his gun and in his pit blind, you know, in the flooded corn of Oklahoma. And this guy is just ducky, hardworking. And I think this, this image says that about him. 
I was and I'm not great at had, portraits, so. <laughs> I was wondering if you had like some specific backstory about him because his, just the way you captured the light and the concentration on his face, it really like, it's like really what's going on in, in his head because it's so much more than just looking for something flying over. Like there's something else going on in there. And I thought it was really, really good capture. Yeah, thank yep. you. One of the, uh, the thing that I noticed about this, you know, having, a lot of dogs and my and my uh, and my shots as well is how he's looking one way and he's looking the other way and they've got each other's back they're both watching two different directions and i find that to be very interesting it's really cool yeah and we're in a pit line and there's ducks kind of flying a little bit of everywhere but we're kind of waiting and yeah yeah really it's cool. just a really cool shot and that guy is just he's something special he's got he's got everything like you said going on in his head that guy is crazy about Dex. <laughs> I really like black and white photos too. Uh, somebody once told me when I first started, if you can take uh, as any successful photograph can be black and white, but not every black and white could be color successfully. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I'm like kind of like going through and calling images, sometimes I even just like turn everything black and white, turn all the colors off as I'm going through and pick really good standout <clears throat> contrasty images. So that was, yeah. that was a nice one. I liked it. Thank you. Yeah, that was really cool. Let's see. Let's throw one more up, and then let's get mm -hmm. into some uh, some Lightroom. People are really excited mm -hmm. to think about the Lightroom. That oh, another sweet. dog photo. <laughs> um, oh, he's running on the surface of the water. He looks like one of those, uh, haze, what is that, Jesus Christ lizards? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this was actually in Nebraska on the plot. Um, this is on a in a in a little hot water spring so that water is about six inches deep or so right there and doug was with me on this hunt and we shot 30 single drake mallards on this hunt and so the the opportunity to move around and make adjustments was you know ample <laughs> and i noticed that he was just wrigley is the dog in that photo he was just charging across this thing and i'm like we need a different perspective. Like this, this, uh, this hot spring is kind of down in this bowl. Like I can't really see it. He, I can't really get the splash. Everybody gets the four straight on or straight away type shot. I need to figure out how to get this shot. And Doug and I were talking and I'm like, what do you think about there's this big cottonwood tree that's like half tilted over. I'm like, what do you think if I like climbed up into the top of that and like shot straight down and you guys, like if you guys, shoot a duck closer to the cottonwood he'll run kind of right under me and so that's what we did i climbed up into it yeah it was, a, <laughs> it was 20 feet up there and it was windy and cold and and uh thanks zach it, i appreciate that it's uh i shot it with 70 to 200 um i can't remember the exact focal length i think i have i think i wrote i wrote it down um but i did uh I can't remember. Um, but I got a little bit of motion in there because he was just, I wanted to show that he's just hauling ass across that thing. Like you can see how you can see his bound. His bound is huge. Um, mm -hmm. the, it's like a cheetah. The reflection, the reflection of his front foot, his front foot out so far is so neat too. Cause it really just like, it's so linear at his position. He's Speed going is for defined it. By the length of the stride and he's <laughs> full stride at that point in water. Nice. He, Definitely. Yep. Um, so they were shot at F5 at ISO 640, you know, probably with the polarizer on and, um, yeah, at 145 on the 7200. Um, just a lot of movement. It was awesome. I can't believe it actually worked. Like we, that happens, right? You envision a shot, but it doesn't always work. This mm -hmm. one between Doug and I, we, we kind of put some things together and put our ideas together. And I climbed up into that tree and he said, I'm not climbing up into that tree. So I did. <laughs> guys, that was a very successful outing for you guys as a, as a group, because you see a lot of photos from that particular hunt from different perspectives and angles um, that, that have been out there and have, have made, mm -hmm. you know, have circulated throughout social media. So, uh, I mean, to have yeah. you, you and Doug and, field all on the same shoot is is i mean what's not going to be good about that <laughs> yeah it was super fun and we just and it's it's fun because it was all drake single drakes right and that's mm -hmm. really unique at least where i come from they fly in big flocks and and uh 
it was funny to see yeah the three of us work together but we would just razz each other because it's like oh it's your turn oh here he comes don't miss him here he comes here he comes here it's he like comes, being in a batting cage right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah with everybody behind you just razzing you trying to make you miss Right. This one stood out to me too. I mean, we see a lot of the sunrise and the sunset shots of the silhouettes, especially with like the decoys all around the water or the ducks around the water. This one was really neat. It was so simple and like you just posed the hunter against that little clump of trees. So uh, kudos on that one. It looks like a painting. I like it. Where is that? Yeah, it looks thank like, you. That, is that New Zealand or is that in? That was that in, in, in. Yep, that's Bass Ham in New Zealand. That's yep. What I, thought. It was, I like it too because the trees are like where the. Where are these trees from? Where is that? There? Cancun. Those trees are actually on the ocean coast. Like the ocean coast is right there at the on the other side of those trees. And we're hunting this flooded uh, paddock that they call, which is just a flooded pasture. Um, yeah, and the ducks were flying, and we shot these two mallards. And I'm like, you have to go out there and get those ducks right. Now you have to go out there. The <laughs> light is too good. Ryan's like, the ducks are flying. We got to keep hunting. I'm like, you have to go get those ducks right now. Go unload your gun or something. Go get those ducks because it is too good. It's really you good. frame that one really well. You know, one of the interesting things I see too is that you, even though they're totally blacked out in the silhouette, you can tell they're mallards, which I think is, you know, telling a telling part of this photograph because again it's all black but because of the way you shot it and framed it and captured that instantaneous whatever it was what, what are what are the specs on that shot uh so it's i, I have them right here uh one six so i shot it with 7200 at 80. Oh, i just happen to have those specs right here <laughs> <laughs> i wrote them down because <laughs> no, i'm glad you you'd, you'd ask me uh 160 at 71 um iso is at 320. I usually always run my ISO around 320-ish if it's going to be dark at all, 320 to 640. I probably shot it with a polarizer. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That that 200 to 400 ISO range is like the sweet spot for people that don't know. So if you go below that or above mm -hmm. that, you're really – cranking or under cranking to accomplish something that you can't within that range, but you're going to get your sweetest, sharpest photos between two and 400 ISO. Wouldn't you agree? I, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm 320, 320, 640, 160, 320 and 640, pretty much what I shoot everything at unless it's in the dark. Right. Mm hmm. So now that we know you have your note sheet of all your specs, so we know how <laughs> wonderfully organized you are, right. let's um, let's dive right. into your process with organizing your photos. I mean, we I was t telling Matt before, like I've got like, I don't know, currently there's probably like 50,000 some odd photos in my Lightroom that are like active. <laughs> and then plus mm -hmm. all of my, I have like seven storage drives on my desk. So there's a lot, there's bulk, there's tons of photos to go through before you even finalize a job. And then what you keep, what you trash, like, let's talk a little bit about your process. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, one of the most intimidating parts about taking photos, right? Now that, digital not film like we don't have to pick our shots really really precisely we can take risk and we can try things and we can we have a little bit more freedom to fail right and it's not going to break our bank so taking going out and taking 500 or a thousand or 1500 photos in a day depending on what happened um obviously when i was first starting out and still to this day it it's it's just exhausting to have to go through it. And how do I pick the best ones? And that's always been, I mean, at least for me, that was always like the number one thing. How do I pick the best one? They all look good or they all look bad. I, mm -hmm. I can't figure out how to do it. Especially so, if you're slamming a, sh a fast shutter, you know, a fast frame rate. I mean, mm -hmm. that stuff adds up. Oh my so, God. Yeah. One of the first times Jake and I went hunting, he had just gotten the 1DX with the, with the, uh -huh machine gun shutter on there so i'm like yeah no problem i'll call through these photos don't you worry about it there's like six thousand of the same photo i'm like oh my god <laughs> but they're not all the same though, right? they're no yeah. they're not all the same so you had to look through them all because some were sharp some weren't some are looking some this way some are looking that way somewhere. yeah 
It's How many lot. photos do you take on an assignment in one day? What's your What's your average, Jake? I would say probably around seven hundred, yeah. somewhere between seven hundred and a thousand. Yep. What about you, Jess? That's about the same. Even for weddings, between seven hundred and a thousand per camera. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, per camera. Yeah. yeah, I'm about that same spot. I, I prefer to be down in that 400, but I just did a, a Yeti commercial Yeti shoot, um, which was a day and a half of shooting. And I shot like 1600 photos because we had to get all these different products and all these different scenarios. Yeah. So, so, how do you question? so yeah, I, I, util I utilize the software uh, Adobe Lightroom. Um, I'm sure I'm guessing that you two both do as well. We do. Um, the reason that we use that is it has all of the editing capabilities that I need as a, you know, just a, a photographer that's not trying to make too many adjustments. I'm not pulling things out or adding things at all. It's, it's really just the image for what it is. And then some quick editing, the editing capabilities are great, but I don't mean to downplay them, but it's not Photoshop. It's uh, it's, it's simplified. And then it's cataloging. So keeping things organized is always the biggest thing for me. It's like, how do I go back? So now that I have these images, how do I go back and find which ones that I like that I shot, you know, last year or earlier in the year, whenever. So um, I guess I can just go through the process, you know, starting out by importing. And when you import, there's a, so for everybody that's using Lightroom, Making sure that you're shooting on RAW is something that, in my opinion, is really important. Have the right drives. I utilize, um, in the field, I utilize something like this. It's just like a, a Samsung um, one terabyte uh, SSD drive for the field. I use two of them, and I back them up, and they're really fast, and they're big enough that I can do a full shoot on them and not worry about it. Um, import them into there. Put them into a folder. The folder layout for me, I like to go by year, and then... By activity, hunting or fishing, so year, hunting or fishing. And then once I get into the hunting, it's like 2018 waterfowl, and then 2018 Oklahoma, 2018 Nebraska, 2018, and then it breaks down. And then from there, it breaks down into the day. And so I can go in and I know that, that I took this photo in 2018 when I was in Oklahoma. I can go back and I can I know roughly where it is. From there... Um, I do, I have a couple of presets that I do, um, uh, upon import, like, let me interrupt you for a second. When you're importing your, for the first time, your images, um, I am importing, making a copy and then directly saving it to a hard drive, not my computer's hard drive. Are you making copies? Are you moving <clears throat> your images? How do you do yours? I create a copy. Yep. So upon import, I create a copy to this drive mm -hmm. and, um, and then I put it in the folder from there. You know, that's okay. my my catalog and everything is all there. Um, I even keep my catalog on different drives too. I don't keep anything on the hard drive for the computer. That's really um, important, especially when you're up or importing a thousand raw images. Those are huge files. And I've already given tutorials to lots of people. They're like, hey, I just started using Lightroom for the first time. My computer's loaded down. I It's full. What do I do? I can't even turn Lightroom on. So it's really important that you guys are not storing your raw files on your hard drive or you will be done after one day. Yep. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And you can't it's, break the links. Don't break your, your links. <laughs> and your computer will be like this. <laughs> really slow. Because <laughs> okay, it's full of data. Yeah. yeah, too too full. Um, so, yeah, a couple of presets. Keeping them organized on the way in um, is really important. Um, so your file naming and everything, making sure that you have the right, the folders labeled correctly so that it's not just a whole bunch of days. Like, May 21st and June 1st and June 8th and you know all of this stuff it's you're never going to remember those days when once you get a month down the road so putting them into a, an actual folder is really important to my process um, once they're imported now you have all these photos and they're all imported and they all look good they have that little JPEG preview and they all look great and, and how do we decide which ones are the best and so First starting out, I'm going to give the process that that Jordan um, at CCAT, when we were there, he's you know doing his own thing now as well, that he kind of came up with and we've kind of adopted and 
adapt it a little bit um, from there. But first starting out when I was started shooting, I, I would get a lot of soft images because I wasn't, I would use a polarizer and I wasn't, you know, real quick on the ISO adjustments and I was shooting in AV, but I wasn't, I was getting a lot of blurry shots when I was shooting against the sun because that was always one of my things. Like I want to shoot more against the sun instead of with the sun. And so I was getting a lot of blurry images. And so what I would do is I would go through every single image, one at a time and one star, everything that's sharp. Every single photo that's actually sharp, I would one star. And now this would get rid of a percentage of photos. And then I would filter by one star. And out of those photos, I would go two star every single photo that I like. So you have this series of photos, let's say it's 10 photos, eight of the 10 are sharp, so now you have eight photos. Five of the 10 I like because his mouth is in the right spot or his leg looks good or his arm looks good or his eyes are open or whatever, so I like five of them. And those are two stars. And then from those two stars, I'd filter the two star and then narrow it down and pick one or two, three stars from that. Like, what is my favorite one out of these five? Why is it my favorite? I don't know. His leg and his eye and everything could be right. And it's sharp and it's just the right composition. Like, it's kind of up to you, right? You're the creative. So it's, it's up to you what you like. That's what people hire you for is your eye. So... Mm -hmm. Which one do you like most out of that? That gets a three star. Go through the whole process like that. Every one of those photos. And now you can filter by three star. And then I would edit, and I still do today. I only go into the three stars and edit just the three stars now. And then I five star my favorite photo from every trip. So that at the end of the year, I can, I can just sort by five stars and I can see my favorite photo from every trip. That's a great, a great yeah. sense of organization. You know, we kind of have to do that when we're uh, editing video because we have so many video clips. We kind of have to do the same thing and, and organize it like that, even though ours may be a little bit more chronological in the video world. It's the same kind of process. And if you don't do that, you just got this overwhelming, you know, amount of data that you have to go yeah. through and. Yeah. A lot of people would rather go mow the yard than go through all those photos. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And go ahead, Jess. I was just going to say, I have a pretty similar process. There's a lot, Lightroom offers you a lot of different ways to filter photos and to mark and label your photos, whether you use the stars, they have something where you can flag it, they have colors. Um, and then you can also filter all your photos <clears throat> by the metadata of your camera, the dates, the times that it was shot, uh, the lens that you use. That's a, one of the favorite ones because sometimes... I just like to go through and see what I was using the most that day. And then maybe on the next trip, I'll just bring that lens because that was the most efficient. Um, but I, I do the similar thing. So I'll go through and kind of call out everything that didn't work. And then um, I was flagging everything that I like, just flagging. So then when I would determine it's time to edit, I'd still have so many photos. But I would say in the last couple of years, I've definitely adopted using the stars, not as thoroughly as you are, but um, the stars really help out a lot. And I really, really enjoy doing um, color labels too. So if I have a shoot where I've shot lifestyle images, product images, detail images, um, I'll go through and also um, filter them by, okay, these are just the, the lifestyle, cool storytelling images. These are just the straightforward product images. And that way I can pull things in and out a lot easier too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I utilize the colors as well. Um, once I have kind of my three star images, then I will go through and I'll star everything or I'll color everything um, yellow. And yellow means that, you know, it's starred, it's ready to be edited. You're and, talking about back background in Lightroom. Yeah, you'll, you'll yellow. You'll yellow. Just, For those of you that aren't familiar with Lightroom, you can color coordinate the background of each slide so that it distinguishes. You know, mm -hmm. whatever just you want to select, so you can group it up into color color coordinated. Yep. So you can see your stars, and you can see the you can see the color of it. And so I'll take all of them and just command all and yellow them all. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then as I edit them, I turn them green and the green is just green as go. They're good to be delivered to anybody that wants them. And then when I actually do deliver it to somebody, I'll turn them blue. And I know that that image has been delivered to somebody, whether that's sick or Yeti and they have, they wanted first rights. So I'll turn it green or I'll turn it red. If like I delivered it and can't send it to anybody else because they 
uh, purchased exclusive rights to that image for a year, I need to not deliver that to anybody else. We've had those issues before and it's just a, it's, it's a lack of organization when that happens because there's no reason that should happen, but it does. So turning it red is in like, don't export that photo ever again. Um, <laughs> blue as in, yeah, Stop. blue as in, you know, it's, it's been delivered and, and green as in it's, it's ready to go anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere, ready to go everywhere. So uh, some more time saving tricks uh, that I don't think a lot of people utilize mm -hmm. um, for starting out with Lightroom because it's such a, at first it's an overwhelming program until you get down to all the nitty gritty details. Uh, you're able to create your own presets. So you, I know you said you have mm -hmm. some and I have some. One of the first things I do, um, I, for the most part, always do the same sharpening and like noise reduction, luminance levels almost on everything. So that's like an immediate process or preset that goes through all of my ready to edit photos. Um, mm -hmm. And that also makes my process for picking my favorites a little better because I'm seeing everything optimized exactly how I know it's going to be at the end as far as the sharpness and getting mm -hmm. at any kind of high SO disturbances or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So do yeah, you have any like yeah. favorite presets that you, that you just run through all the time or? So I adjust the tone curve every time I, um, I calibrate, um, and do the lens corrections every time, basically flatten the image mm -hmm. um, because of the convex of the lens, you know, creates a distortion that doesn't need to be there. So I flatten it every time. Um, I sharpen it to about 40 um, every time. Um, there's some minor things that if it's shot in the dark and the ISO is really high, I don't sharpen it, but usually I sharpen them all. And a lot of those things I do on import. So when you create that import preset, then as soon as I import it, it's already importing it with those edits on it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, then then I can go through and make the individual adjustments. And, and uh, one good thing to point out is that familiarizing, what really sped up this process is when I was able to familiarize myself with the keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> so I don't even use a mouse or the pad or anything. I just use all keyboard all the time for everything. And Wow. That way you can just kind of like yeah. just go and you get into kind of a, a, a rhythm and you understand where everything is. You don't ever have to look at the keyboard and you can just watch the image and you can make things happen. And that's really a, a pretty cool thing to be able to do. And Lightroom has tutorials on all of the keyboard shortcuts and there's way more than you would ever use. But mm -hmm. You can even get like on Amazon, like keyboard overlays for when you're first learning to have mm -hmm. cheat sheets on them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The keyboard, uh, utilizing the keyboard is, is huge for, for productivity and efficiency. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I built, go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, if, for those of you that don't realize that you can, you can, if you have a certain look that you like, you can go through, take one photo. If there, if there's a lot of photos that are similar, build, build a look, a color grade for it, and then establish that and save it as your own preset, pull that into your preset files, and then select the photos that have similar color, you know, uh, exposure levels or whatever, and boom, select all those photos and just swipe that thing right into all that. And then, you know, if you like that look, you're done, or at least you're close to being done, mm -hmm. and it saves you that much more time as well. Yeah, my favorites. There's a copy paste setting option. So yeah. just like, copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. And uh, you can go in and say you're going to, you've set 15 different settings on a photo. There's exposure, there's white balance, uh, sharpness, contrast, blacks, whites, all sorts of things. And you've gone and set that for all of them. You copy and paste that to the next photo, but maybe there's a slight difference. Um, so you can also uncheck to to only copy certain settings from a photo to the next. Mm -hmm. So there's once you really get into... The, the fluidity of the program is just, it's just like, if you're not using it, you will punch yourself in the face after you realize all the time you wasted. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. takes the overwhelming factor out of it. Like you don't dread it anymore once you learn how to do all these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of tutorials on how to do it. And I recommend watching them if you don't have somebody to teach you on hand. I remember, I recommend just getting on, you know, watching Chase Jarvis do it or watching whoever do it. Yeah, copy paste for life. Me too, man. Like for sure. Hashtag, hashtag copy paste for life. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it's 
it's a little bit intimidating when you first get into it, but so is taking a thousand photos in a day. So, mm -hmm. you know, undertaking that once you, once you've decided to go ahead and take that step that you're going to start trying things and take risks and learn how to use that camera. It's funny that, so you know, these things we're talking Lightroom. about seem so complicated, but the fact of the matter is the complications behind learning all this stuff actually simplifies it. So it's not complicated mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, some of the most important things like we already covered with Lightroom is before you really start using it seriously, make sure you've set up your structure of how you want to organize things. Because once once these things start going into certain places, that's where you're going to want to keep them. Because if you start moving them, you're going to break links. The next time you open up your Lightroom catalog, everything's going to have a big question mark on it. And you can't export anything because you don't have the native files that you started with. So definitely keep everything where you've determined before you started editing. Um, and then upon exporting, there are a ton of options as well. You can export as the raw file, a JPEG, a TIFF, a DNG, a, everything. Um, and you can set presets for your exports as well. I always export for the most part, the same exact thing. Um, you can set resolution and um, DPI upon exporting. So if you're always exporting for print or you're exporting for web, um, you can do that as well. There's a lot of yeah. neat options there. Yeah, a lot of options, a little bit intimidating for people that go into exports. Like, how do I even export this now? Mm -hmm. I want to send it to a client or I want to send it to my mom to print or I want to or I want to put it on my Instagram account and don't want to, you know, use all the data on my phone or use all the, you know, hard drive space on my phone. That's a good one. <laughs> 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 right. I'm going to go um, ahead and ask you to use Lightroom, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the uh the export that I use most often for web is is limiting the limiting it to 2 megabytes. So I'll do the max resolution at 2 megabytes and allow Lightroom to determine what that is. 300 DPI and just like Ex limit the file to two megabytes and a lot of times it comes out you know one six somewhere around one six to one eight and you get a really high quality image for web wouldn't be great for printing it's it'll be okay for printing um but again you can go in and make a preset to where it's like this is this is what i like and then you just click that and can roll on every single time and and high resolution i do jpegs always but High resolution is going to be, you know, max capacity, 100 quality at 300 DPI. And that's going to give you your biggest, best JPEG file that your camera can output. So once I'm done with everything, and maybe you're the same, we've, we've <clears throat> delivered everything, we've exported everything, we've archived all of our final files. I hold on to the RAWs in Lightroom for a little while and make sure that I haven't changed my mind. I want to go back and tweak anything. Um, but the majority, the bulk of all of my RAW files that I've started with, I trash those at the end. There's no mm. reason to store all that kind of stuff forever. Um, do you have any kind of tips or any kind of suggestions for not trashing your stuff preemptively? Yeah, and I don't trash anything. Um, and I, I eventually, I'm sure I will. But I mean, still you keep all day, your raws keep... from all your shoots for from everything, all the raws. Oh not all the raws. I, <laughs> I, get, like rid I, of, <laughs> I, I get rid of. I get rid of all of the. Cool. I get rid of the zero stars so yeah. through that starring process. I get rid of everything that's blurry. Mm -hmm. But your what finals, keep you keep your raws and your final JPEGs. I'm keeping them. It's probably not the most efficient way. Um, I keep them all. And I go back and look at them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like having them in Lightroom. That's, the, that's my preferred way to view my images as well. So, like, getting rid of the raws then pulls them out of Lightroom. And Do I you have like that either. So would you say your catalog encompasses a couple months, a year, more than that? I usually do per year. Create a new catalog per year. That's pretty, yeah. That's pretty, I think that's pretty standard, at least for a lot of people that I've talked to as well, depending on how many photos you shoot, obviously, how much space you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you can hold one master catalog that holds everything, you know, mm -hmm. if you want. And that's fine, too, as long as you have a couple copies of it. You know, one thing that Adam Barker really, really preaches is backing your stuff up and keeping a second backup of all of your stuff somewhere away from you. Yep. 
leave it at your buddy's house in his safe or put it in your safe and oh, just away, just in case something happens, you drop a drive or you, you know, it breaks. They do break mm -hmm. on their own for no reason. They so. ha yeah, I think we've all experienced <laughs> that terrifying moment. So yeah. I keep everything um, at any given time. I've got everything backs up to my Dropbox. So I've got like, a cloud. And then I also mm -hmm. have two drives that make simultaneous copies for all of my live working stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But especially, I work also doing weddings. So it's like if I were to lose that, holy crap, I would be a just creek without a paddle. Um, everything I have is backed up th in three places. So yeah. my my cloud backup is kind of like my away from my computer thing. And then I have two drives plugged in that are syncing, are backing up all the time. Then I have the third drive. The mm -hmm. no one touches this drive, do not use this drive. And all, everything gets put on there every once in a while. I just like a third when safe I, haven. <laughs> yeah, when I go on trips, you know, I carry small G-Raid uh they they spin at a high rpm so they process really fast i carry uh four terabytes two two terabyte mini hard drives with me and i back everything up every or i i i, I, I transfer everything off the cards onto the hard drive every night and it goes day one you know whatever argentina day one argentina day two argentina day three and then when I'm done with everything on the last day, then the, before I go to sleep that the last night, then I dump everything to another hard drive and I give that hard drive to my client or someone else on a different flight. That way, if my plane were to go down or something bad were to happen <laughs> or whatever, you know, you never know, then someone else has got a copy of all the content that came out of that shoot because it's important to someone. Someone invested their money in me. Someone in, invested their money in the time and the trip and the effort to do it and if you lose all that content guess what <laughs> yeah yeah it's <laughs> a bad deal Ugh. awesome have well, you ever had any uh any before we go have you ever had any like really bad in the field experiences where you lost something or like broke something or or something along those lines right. like what's the worst thing the very first very top of mind thing um, the first time I ever broke something, I fell, uh, walking, walking uphill and my lens filter broke on my camera and I couldn't unscrew the filter cause it dented on. So I'm sitting there with a knife chiseling the glass from my filter off of the glass of my lens so that I could still use the dang lens. So that oh. was, uh, luckily I didn't, it didn't damage the actual glass on my lens at all. Thank God. Um, but the people I were with were like, uh, is everything going to be okay? As I'm sitting there like chiseling Crying. out my <laughs> camera. <laughs> um, but that I think is the worst breaking thing. And then, God, knock on wood, I haven't had any corruption issues or lost anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I have had a personal drive of mine break once. And so that bad, was yeah. pretty detrimental because it was like, had some photos of baby stuff and personal yeah. events. So that after that happened moving forward professionally, it was just like, I'm just going to have like at least three of everything going at all times. <laughs> mm -hmm. What about you, Jake? Oh, that's easy for me. I, I was on a shoot with Alex Brittingham um, oh. and John Phelan. Uh, uh, when, when, when is that? That was this early Last this year. spring. Yeah. And I dumped, yeah. uh, I dumped my entire red, uh, rig into a Louisiana swamp. <laughs> <laughs> it was underwater for at You're least. You're known for that. Oh, man, it's I get this happen. text message like, I'm so <laughs> glad I have insurance. I just killed my red. Like I literally put the fire out. I mean, that was, like, that was pretty bad, but you know, I do have insurance. So I wasn't com a complete, yeah, yeah. wasn't a complete disaster. And it was like the last day of the shoot. So I had all that other content, you know, uh, on hard drives. So it turned out. Okay. The other thing is I was on a super retriever series event, uh, a while back. And one of the, the guy on the, on the switchboard, we were shooting a live event, but we were banking everything for, you know, uh, uh, an edited production later on that was gonna, that was gonna air. And this is something that everyone needs to understand because we may all, I have like multiple hard drives hooked up to all my editing suites. And when you go to reformat a hard drive, unplug all the other hard drives <laughs> 
from your computer so you don't get confused because we were on a shoot one time one of my very good friends who's an extremely well he's extremely experienced and talented guy production guy he works for espn the weather channel like the guy knows his crap right he went to he went to reformat a new hard drive that he was about to back everything up on and he accidentally reformatted the drive that had all the live coverage on and it was a oh oh my god like like it was like um i think i'm gonna leave the trailer right now and go throw up (laughs) but you know it was a disaster and actually you know if that happens for all you guys out there that don't know this which i didn't at the time but i do now you can go purchase software that can go into your hard drive and find that information and restore it. Don't do anything very- else after that. Like keep it as no. is or take it to a professional camera store. They also have it. Do not mess around. Try to find it, plug it in and out 25 times because you're just lowering your chances of recovering yes. anything. Treat it like a rattlesnake bite. Don't panic and don't get your adrenaline going <laughs> and take, you know, <laughs> the format button should be treated like a trigger. Like, do not touch the format button until you right. know you have you have acknowledged the target of formatting your card. Like, do not right. touch it. Ugh. Yeah, I have I a-, a bin of camera cards, and I have so many camera cards, but I keep like this bin. And as as the jobs have been old, like my old cards go in there because like every month or so, like I go through them and say like, okay, this job is delivered, completed, archived. I can use this card again, but I keep them all on the cards for as long as I possibly can. Just as like the most absolute, like last, last chance backup option. Yeah. (laughs) So scary. Even putting format when you're ready to format something, it's just like, did Uh, I do everything right? Do I have everything off here? (laughs) Yeah. What about you, Matt? (laughs) Let's hear your uh, your worst moments in the field. Yeah, I have two. A formatting one where uh, Camille and I were in Alaska, um, up at her parents her parents' place, and we had just gotten done with some really really awesome fishing. Um, she had caught like a fifty pound king on the fly, and like it was epic, awesome photos. <laughs> and we had eaten dinner, go back out and do some more fishing, and somehow, like. Somehow I I don't even know how it happened. You're about to throw up again. <laughs> Something happened to where to where the the camera the menu button was open on the camera and I had left the menu on the format card thing oh. and I just like oh. pushed OK, not even think like it's around my neck. I just push OK, not even thinking, and I'm just like I'm going fishing like, and all of the stuff was gone and I'm standing in the middle of the river and Camille's getting excited to go do some more fishing and I'm just like. About ready to throw up, literally about ready to throw up, oh, and uh, and yeah, I mean we'll never get those images back, right? But um, so now I always, always, when I after I reformat a card, I move the menu button over and up so that so that it's sitting somewhere in focus or in camera or in play or wherever it's sitting somewhere else. So if the menu button does get pushed, like it doesn't, doesn't happen. It's like a, it's like a butt, it's like butt dialing someone. Yep. Yep. Here's a and, little thing. This is for uh, the super beginner <laughs> people who watch us. And it actually, it took me a little while until I realized too, like I never just looked at it to care, but on your SD card, there's this little thing you can lock. flip. It's a lock button. You should utilize this. Yeah, if you're I've taking formatted that, yeah. cards quickly, just been like, oh, I, I've got this card. Let me just real quick. I need to change cards and lost like whatever from a trip, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, we utilize me. that at, at Bassmaster because we have so many cameras and so much <laughs> media going into one bag for each day of the event. And these are live events, but we also have responsibility for three airings of the TV yep. show on, on different networks. So all these media cards go into one big bag and they're all labeled who shot what, but we also, we use that locking tab on those SD cards because that ensures us that nothing can happen to that media card as it, cause it's going to go through three or four hands before it gets back to the, you know, the editing studio in Little Rock, Arkansas. So that's a very good point. Yeah. Well, and then the, the last thing I, w- I want to tell this story real quick. Definitely. We were in, <laughs> we were in, I know we're a little over. No, it's no, fine. Go ahead, it's fine. Um, we like crash and burn we have no stories. Time limits. <laughs> 
I was on a trip last year in May. Camille and I went to Christmas Island. Uh, we were there uh, with Yellow Dog, but then we were doing a, a shoot with kind of just a two person, her and I shoot for Yeti, um, where we were telling a story about Christmas Island. And it was, you know, in part with this product launch and all of this stuff. And uh, pretty cool opportunity. It was the first, one of the first times that they had sent both of us somewhere outside of Alaska, sent us somewhere else to like go tell this story and this place. And so the very first at Christmas Island, for those that don't know, it's like 1500 miles west of Hawaii. So you take like a 737 into the tiny little like grass strip. And it's a, it's just in the middle of the South Pacific and, and there's nobody there except for there's one flight a week and it's all anglers and it's every week. Um, and so we go in there and we're it's all well excited. Known for bonefish, right? Bone fishing. Yep. And GTs and trigger fish. Um, and then they have Permits. some offshore fishing there. Yep. And mm -hmm. there's no permit. Um, it's okay. all, it's all just like bonefish and GTs and trigger fish. Um, and uh, yeah, the story is super cool. It's up on, maybe up on Yeti's website. I, I don't know, they keep changing their website. Anyways, I'm there for one day. I wake up the next morning, I'm the first one up. I'm like, I wanna get sunrise images of this lodge and everything. So I put the camera on the tripod and I got the remote and I'm using my 16 to 35 and I have an underwater housing that I was gonna be using as well. And, and uh, just really excited to be they're getting ready to use the underwater housing and all this stuff. And so sunrise is coming up and there's all these, you know, beautiful palm trees. Like, I mean, it's clean, it's beautiful. And I take like three images and I go to take another one and the wind's blowing a little bit. And all of a sudden my camera falls off of the tripod, uh. falls onto the ground and breaks in two pieces. Ugh. So my lens broke at the collar on my camera and so now my 16 to 35 is gone. And because we're so far away, I only brought one wide angle and I brought a 70 to 200 and a 100 macro. That's all I brought. So now I don't, I'm on a fly fishing shoot and I don't have a wide angle and it's the first day. Oh man. And I just remember just sitting out there on the beach, just sitting out there looking out into the <laughs> You're like, You're like, I'm gonna need an extra boat so I can shoot with my 7200. <laughs> Nobody's hey, a... You delivered a Christmas island <laughs> overnight. What overnight? are your express <laughs> options? There's no flights. There's no way. Um, which was a really interesting spot to be in. I've never had that happen. I always, since then, now all all of last year, I bring two wide angle lenses with me just in case something like that happens. <laughs> I don't like bringing that much stuff with me, but I like airports and stuff. It's just tough, but um, it was a really humbling experience, but we had to figure it out, right? So I went and got Camille and, and we talked through it and it's just like, we're going to have to do something totally different that nobody's done. A lot of people in the fly fishing industry take 7,200 photos. I wasn't planning on using that lens much. So I put the macro on and took a pile of 100 prime macro photos over the course of this trip. And I think eight of the 10 photos that Yeti used were all shot with that macro lens. Awesome. And I got a ton of photos that I would have never gotten. I, I sent you guys one, which is that GTI. Mm -hmm. That photo is one of my favorite photos ever. And it reminds me that that you can figure it out and you can overcome exactly. that adversity and yeah. you just got to be creative. And, and instead of getting into this slump of like, this is what I'm used to. And I love this lens and I love this and I love that. And it's easy and it's routine. This forced me to come out of that, my comfort zone a little bit and, and got some photos like that. And I would have never gotten that shot and that shot's printed really big in our house. And it's my favorite photo. I mean, one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. And it was because I broke a lens. <laughs> I tell people all the time, you know, there, you, you may start out with two lenses, say a 24, 70 to seven and 70 to 200. Those are your get, you know, go to entry level lenses that everyone needs. But then if you really want to understand <laughs> photography, you have to understand your equipment. So if you take, if you, if you end up with a series of say, you know, from 11 millimeters all the way out to five, four or 500 millimeters, take one lens out and go do a shoot on your own 
And you'll be surprised about how much you learn about that one lens and, and where you learn the sweet spot and, and, a lot of, and a lot of different variables about that lens. And then if you do that with each lens, then you understand what you're going to get out of each lens. And then you know how to pick your weapons before you go on a trip because you understand how they work. Right. And that's yeah. I mean, to me, that's what lesson that came out of there. You know, you were forced into adjusting to the situation and, and look what happened, you know. Yeah, you figured it out. It worked. Um, yeah, it was really cool. It's just, but in the time, obviously, you're just nothing. Nothing <laughs> could be worse at that moment. Yeah. Um, right. But you figure it out. So, well, where can everybody who obviously doesn't, not everybody knows where to find your photos yeah. at, but they should. Um, give us your Instagram handle and your website and anything else you got cooking you'd like to. Yeah. Promote? Matt McCormick 05. Instagram is my number one source of um, advertising for myself. I don't do a lot of it. Um, I need to do more. I do some. Um, hunting season will be usually ramps up um, kind of what I'm outputting. Um, so Matt McCormick 05 is where you're going to find the majority of my stuff. Live Instagram stories and then the handle is, is great as well. Utilize Facebook a little bit. It's pretty much just shared over. Um, don't have a website. Most of my work is coming from word of mouth and I don't have time to manage a website. It's just kind of <laughs> the way it is. I don't, you could argue either way of if you need one or if you don't, I don't have one. Um, I have one, but it's not, it's just for image delivery. Um, it's not for, mm -hmm. it's not for anything else. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the sick of world is really where I'm the most immersed in. Um, sick of waterfowl is, is really kind of my niche, um, waterfowl in general, but, um, do a bunch of stuff with rig and rights as well on the waterfowl side. And then, uh, you know, pretty much anything with Camille in it, um, on Yeti stuff is, is usually me. Um, yeah, Yeti, sick, uh, rig and right. Keep me pretty busy. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got, you know, you've, you've, you've pumped out a lot of really inspirational, um, photos and mm -hmm. motivating photos. I'm a big fan of art all the way around. And, you mm -hmm. know, I can honestly say that your, your work is art and uh, we all appreciate it very much. And, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for all the great work that you do out there because it elevates everyone else around you, including, you know, everyone in the outdoor space. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for everything that you do, Matt. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. This is, this is kind of the most innovative thing I've seen happen in a long time, which is just yes. telling all of our stories. Hi. I mean, that's, that's, that's why we did this. this. There's so yeah, much the, battle between everybody against one another. It's nice to have a space where we can just do our exactly. thing together and not have egos floating everywhere and worry about yeah. all the of nitty gritty. Course. Of course. Yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's great. Keep it up and, and uh, yeah, I'll look forward to coming on again and maybe, talking Definitely. on a big panel or, or going let's through tell a story. Let's, yeah. Let's go through a telling a storytelling. We're going to save that show for you, Matt. <laughs> oh, I look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. And for okay. everybody watching, get your photos in diverge. Diverge is starting. I think the 15th of September, it's a really cool opportunity to get your, get your work out there and in front of some, some, some pretty awesome people. So. Yeah, we're excited about that too. Well, thanks yep. so much again, Matt. It was really nice to spend the morning with you. You had some really insightful things to share with us, get us all back to order and organization. So we appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll have you on again anytime. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks, all right, Matt. We'll catch up with you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs> See ya. See you, buddy. That was cool. Yeah. Makes me feel like... Like I like talking about Lightroom with, with all sorts of photographers because everybody uses it differently and I always take something from it and I feel like I get more efficient. Um, and the same thing, like he says, like when you get to bounce your work off of people and, and discuss things, like you just become, you get, you gain something each time. So it's always awesome. And Matt's an easy, great person to talk to. He's got a lot of enthusiasm and lots of good stories to share. So I knew it'd be a good he's one. always he's always positive. I mean, you know, if you ever if you ever go to a trade show and you stop by the uh, the Sitka booth and you see Matt, definitely go up and say hi. He's very easy to talk to. Um, it's always an interesting conversation, and uh, he's just he's just a great a great guy. Mm -hmm. 
So, maybe next time we should we should talk about Photoshop too. We talked about Lightroom a little bit, and maybe we should talk about Photoshop sometime too because that's a very important component in uh, being a professional photographer as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I could definitely get into a big conversation on Photoshop. I've got a lot of experience in it. I don't hardly use it that much anymore, but in the beginning oh, stages, I, I mean, before I used Lightroom and even before I became a professional photographer, I played around in Photoshop doing things for graphic design work and things like that. Like that's, that's an integral part of my background. I've got a friend, um, uh, Blake Fisher at RNT. He is a master at fo uh, Photoshop uh, building composites or, you know, uh, doing brand uh, imagery of product shots or whatever it is, he would be a really great guest to have on here. And I've talked to him about it. So maybe we'll sa we'll save that show for him. How's that? All right. Sounds good. Well, you have a good week, Jake. Uh, get some rest and relaxation. You've been on yeah. the go. <laughs> yep. Got a lot of editing to catch up on before I head out to my next trip, but uh, it was great to see you and I'm looking forward, looking forward to the next one. Don't forget to come onto our YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. Go check out our YouTube channel. It's the outdoor camera outdoor cameraman experience on YouTube. All the mm -hmm. episodes are posted there. We're going to start putting up. I think we've got a few weeks coming up here that we're going to miss. So, it's we're gonna put season, so generally, it's obviously we're not going to be here. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, you know, we'll have some tutorials and reviews on products that live there as well. So come by and check it out. And please, please subscribe to our channel. Yeah, um, you'll be notified as soon as something new comes up. And uh, if you guys have, again, questions, suggestions, anything you want us to talk about or some topics, we're happy and open to all your feedback. And we love all your comments during the show. It really makes it fun. So bye, Jake. Bye, Jess. <laughs>